right, and we're live. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. For those of you we've got a great group here tonight with us in person. And I'll thank all of you at home for joining us. Some of you live. Some of you catching us later on this week. Just glad you're being a part of our Bible study. Let's go back. We're going to finish up, I promise you. We're going to finish up chapter 12 of Romans tonight. So let's go back there. And I want to pick up again with verse 9 and read. We went through 9 through 19 last week, but I want to read 9 through 19 and pick up and finish up with verses 20 and 21. So anyway, while we're opening up, once again, our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 9 again, I want to open us up with the word of prayer. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, once again, we are honored and blessed to be here in your house, to be able to be one with each other with you through the power of your spirit here and the power of your spirit that connects us in all the different places that we are. So dear God, just bless us now, whether we're here in this sanctuary or at our homes, no matter what it is, we are still one with, the, with each other with you through the power of your Holy Spirit. So once again, now you lead us, you anoint us, and you guide us. Most importantly, help us to make this as always, and should all things be, to make it about you. Mm -hmm. And we ask all of this always in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, so join me again, because I know we got a couple of folks here tonight that weren't here with this last Wednesday, so I wanted you to hear this as well. So pick up with verse 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Mm -hmm. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. <clears throat> be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And here we're going to pick up for tonight. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right, let's stop there for a moment. Now, as you remember last week, as we picked up in verse 9, that section, it's known as the marks of the true Christian. And he opens up this section there, verses 9 through 13, with that list of guidelines. We talked about some translations have it as 10, some have it as 12. Personally, I count 13 of them there. But the bottom line is this, to truly understand what those are in verses 9 through 13, you have to go beyond the English. Remember we talked about in the English text or the English translation. The English likes to make them all individual commands. That they're all each individual separate of themselves. But in the original Greek we talked about that only that first one, let love be genuine or let love sincere, that is the only command. The rest of them listed in the Greek, you remember, they're in response. They're in response to that command of love. So let love be genuine or sincere. Then in the Greek, it's hating what is evil, clinging to what is good, honoring one another, serving the Lord, and so forth and so forth. But we talked about that the love we are commanded to love, it's not just a genuine or sincere. Remember in the Greek, once again, it says... Let our love be unhypocritical, or let love be without hypocrisy. And then we picked up in verse 14, and I told you things are about to now get hard. Things are about to get hard because it's easy to do the things listed in 9 to 13 with your family, your friends, or if you got a good neighbor. It's easy to do it. But when Paul calls us to the next level of things, 
Paul is saying that we are to now live out these guidelines among the lives of those who are not family, friends, or neighbors, but to those who hate us. Live these things out to those who do not love us, and no matter what we do, will never love us in return. And if you remember, it's here then that Paul, verses 14 and 19, gives us another six additional guidelines that we are called to do in love, such as blessing those who persecute you, do not return evil with evil, and that's a key one, remember that, okay? Live peaceably with everyone. Do not seek vengeance. And the thing is, we talked about the fact that we're not to do these things because to do them means that you are doing what? We're, we're returning evil with evil. evil, okay? And that's why we should always remember that interpretation of verse 17 I shared with you last week. Do not return evil with evil, but return evil with good so that others will know who you belong. Now, as we concluded all that last week, I asked you now, so are any of these things, is it easy stuff to do? And we all agreed, no, it's not. These are actually hard things that we can do. Well, now Paul's about to take us to the second level, folks. We're about to go to the next level. Things are going to get even harder now as we look at the conclusion of chapter 12 and then move into chapter 13. So now join me at verse 20. So this is where we're going to pick up. So, now, once again, there are two more guidelines. So what are the two final, two last guidelines that Paul is now calling us to do to live out the marks of being a true Christian? So the first one is if, if someone is hungry, we are to what? Give them something to eat. And if that person is thirsty, give them something to drink. But what's the key? What is the key that is, is about this? What is the key that Paul says we are to give this drink to? Well, it's what it say in verse 20. If you're what? If, you, if it's your enemy. If you're enemy. Once again, it's easy to sit down at a table and eat food and have a drink with a friend or family member, but that's not what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to do that with who? Your enemy. No, if your enemies are hungry, if your enemies are thirsty, okay? But is this the real question that must be asked? No, the real question is this. What is it that makes these makes doing these things so very hard? Why does it that makes these things so hard to do? Well, the thing is, these things are hard for us, for anyone to do, for two basic reasons. First off, because to do these things means that we have to do what? The first off, to do these things for your enemy means that we have to do what? That we have to go completely against the way what tells us to do things? The flesh. Not the flesh. The world. See, the thing is, the world tells us completely different, okay? These are, uh, because these are things that, uh, that the world would not want us to do, okay? That we have to go completely against the way the world calls us to do things. But more importantly, if we choose to do the opposite of these things, if we choose not to give food or drink, to our enemy when they are hungry or thirsty means then that we become what kind of people? What kind of people do we become if we refuse to not give food or drink to our enemy? Unchristian. Okay, unchristian. Very good. That's the first start. What else do we become? See, we can then become the kind of people that who wants us to be? The devil. the devil, that the world wants to be. Because what you become, if you refuse to do this for your enemy, then we become what one commentator called a get-even people. Because that's what you're doing. You're getting even. You didn't give me something to eat, so I'm not going to give you something to eat. You didn't give me, you're my enemy, so I'm going to do that. It means that we become the get-even people, which is what? The exact opposite of being a person who lives out the what? 
Remember what's this about? The what? The marks of living as a true, Christ, but not just a Christian, true Christian, a true Christian. So the thing is, first off, if we don't do it, we're just doing what we're playing to the hands of the world, into the hands of the devil, and we become get even people. But here's the second reason why: that to use such things like this then as a weapon, because that's the thing you want to do with your enemy. You want to strike back. You can use a weapon. Use some of this as a weapon to settle the settle score. Use it as a weapon to hold a grudge against your enemy. In the end, you only do what two things. First off, to do these things, you're not going to end or solve the problem. All you're going to do is cause the problem to get worse. 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 You know, the thing is, you hurt me, I hurt you, somebody else hurts me on your behalf, somebody hurts that person. I mean, and it just, it, things will get worse. Okay? The thing is, to return evil with evil only worsens or increases the problem. But here's the really bad thing about it. If we shall choose to hold a grudge, use a weapon. See, it mean that in the end, you will, who will be the only winner left standing? The no devil. one. The devil. No. Evil itself. Because it means that evil wins. Now, once again, this is the set, this is the next level, folks. Is it gonna be easy? No. Alright? But, but this is what he's calling us to do. But now, let's take it the next step here. Because Paul then takes these two last guidelines. You have to know this. What he does, he takes him from the book of Proverbs. This comes directly from Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. And according to this Old Testament book of Proverbs, what can be the result? I'm sorry. What is the result of what happens when we're willing to give food and drink to our enemy? What's the result? You heat the burning coals. All right. Or by doing this, you will what? Heat burning coals where? On his head. On, on their heads. On his head. On their heads. Now, the thing is this. There's, because it comes from an Old Testament book, this Old Testament book of Proverbs, what becomes then the classic, a misunderstanding or a complete mistake concerning or interpreting what this is actually about to say you will, you know, heat burning coals on his head or her head or on their heads. There's a classic mistake that happens. You see, because it originates, because it originates from the Old Testament, a lot of people like to see this as a description of what? As a form or description of what then? Because it's from the Old Testament where you get an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth stuff. Like a prophecy? Okay, not just a prophecy. More than a prophecy. A lot of people, because it comes from the Old Testament, well, if I'm going to leak heat, you know, coals upon somebody's head, that you're actually bringing about a form of what upon a person? Punishment. Punishment. They see this as a, a lot of people want to see this as a form, a description of punishment, a way to be punished, okay? And that's why even in today, I know I have heard this before, talking about describing it as a form of punishment for, you know, against our enemy as well. But the truth is, it's got nothing to do with punishment. Hmm. To heat burning coals on somebody's head has nothing to do with punishment or being punished for something that you did to hurt or offend someone. Because truth is, to punish someone to punish someone by actually heaping burning coals on their heads means that you are really doing what? That you are, remember what I tell you is the key thing to remember? That you are returning evil for evil. Evil for evil. Somebody does something to you and you stack, instead of forgiving them, you start building up burning coals on their head. You're just returning evil for evil. Or evil with evil. But as Christians, True Christians, we are called to do what? To return evil with good. good or with goodness. But worst of all, 
If you do this, if you see this as a punishment and enjoy it as a punishment, then you're really allowing what to happen. You are allowing what to win? The evil. You're allowing evil to win. But to not only allow evil to win, you also allow evil to win where? In, in your, your heart. heart. In your heart. In your heart. In your life. I, I have life, but I like heart better. I'm going to add that afterwards. I like that word heart. In your heart. You're allowing evil to win, okay? So the question now becomes then, so what does that Old Testament writer of Proverbs, along with Paul, mean? When they say that to do these things means that you're heaping burning coals on the head of your enemy. Well, see, this is actually, it goes back to a what they call a repentance ritual that started back all the way in ancient Egypt. A repentance ritual back in ancient Egypt times. You see, back in that time of ancient Egypt, when someone wanted to make amends, wanted to apologize for something they had done wrong to someone, Jack has hurt me. Jack has offended me in some way, okay? And he wants to make amends or apology. They, what Jack would do is that he would carry on his head a tray or a bowl that was filled with hot coals. As a way of saying, Sam, I'm sorry for what I did. It's an, an outward showing of repentance, okay? See, so they did this as an outward sign or an outward evidence of their genuine repentance for what they had done to that person. Hmm. They did this as a sign to let the one they had hurt or the one they had offended know that they truly did want to be forgiven for the wrong or the wrongs they had committed. But the biggest thing is this most important. That person who was carrying the coals, seeking forgiveness, they did not do it because they had to or were being forced to do it. They did it because they want. They wanted to do it. They want that forgiveness. And so they are actively seeking forgiveness on their own for what they had done. So what are Proverbs and Paul? Saying to us concerning then these burning coals on top of someone's head. What it's about is this, that when you and I choose to do these things and not return evil with evil, but when we give something to eat to someone, our enemy, who is hungry, we give drink to our enemy, someone who is thirsty, what are we really doing? Calling them to repentance. Calling, okay, first off, we're calling them to repentance. But how do we do that? How do we call them into repentance by <coughs> giving them something to eat or giving them something to drink? What we're doing is we're trying to help call them into that repentance, but how do we do that? Well, see, first off, we're giving them what? I, if Goodness. I'm your enemy, okay, or let's say you're my enemy. Once again, I'll just use Jack as an example. Jack is my enemy. And he and I are just, you know, born enemies. Our, we're, you know, Romeo and Juliet's families or the Hatfield McCoy side. Oh, Mr. Mississippi, Mississippi State. Mississippi State. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, that's it. Bring, bring it home. <laughs> Jack. The bottom line is, what's the last thing Jack's going to expect me to do? Be nice to him. To be nice to him and to give him what? Something to eat, something to drink. That's the last thing, first off, your enemy is expecting from you, right? Mm -hmm. Secondly, we are meeting them where? Remember, I've always said, what did Jesus come to do? He came to meet us where? At the point of our needs. At need. the point of our needs. We're meeting that enemy at the point of their needs. Well, now, if they're stronger, they just take what they want. Well, now, we'll get into that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Talk about that. But the thing is, most important, we're being who for them? Jesus. Being Jesus. We're being Jesus for them. Which, according to both the writer of Proverbs and Paul, was in, if we're really 
to do this. It will cause our enemy to want to come and ask us for forgiveness. Even if they're more powerful. Even if they are bigger than us. And of course, yes, they can come and they can hurt us. Okay? But, that's, but hey, we're not responsible for what they do. We're only responsible for what? Us. For what we did. You know, I'm not responsible for what y'all do. I can preach to you all day long, but when you leave this church, you're what? On your own. You're on your own. Between you and God, then. You know, how many times have, I can't tell you the number of times somebody has done something, said a word that they've been able to in front of the preacher, and the first thing, oh, preacher, I'm sorry. Don't apologize to me. <laughs> That's between you and God, not me and you, type stuff. It doesn't matter. We're called to do what? To give love, to give food to our enemy, to give drink to our enemy. Even if what? Even if they're not going to love us in return. That's their choice, okay? But now Paul's not finished. So go over to verse 21. Alright? Because here in this verse, to help us to do these things, Paul is now offering what can be described then as a counter-offensive move on our part. Now, once again, our human instinct of self-preservation, our instinct for survival tells us what? That to do this in return to our enemy is still the quickest way for what to happen to us. Instinct, human instinct says, well, if I do this to my enemy, what's going to happen to me? They're still going to do what? Hurt me back. Take advantage of me. That's what our mind is going to tell us. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because the quickest way, you know, for, for it to happen to us is if we do that, it's like you turn your back on me. And then they're going to take advantage of you. They're going to hurt you. Now, Paul knows that there is evil out there in this world. But what... Paul wants you and I to always remember is the way that God met evil when he came into this world. You see, because when coming up against evil, God did not use what? Evil. Evil. First off, he didn't use any weapons of war, of annihilation. He did not use a greater what, Sandy? He didn't come up with, he didn't defeat evil with a greater form. Evil. Evil. Okay? And he did not use the ultimate weapon of death to overcome, defeat evil. Yes, sir. The battle of Jericho. Huh? The battle of Jericho. Well, that, I, well, that, I talk about Jesus. When Jesus came into the, you know, to, to, to this world. I'm not talking about back in the Old Testament. I'm, back, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking about Jesus. When God came into this world, he did not defeat evil with a greater evil. Okay? Instead, Christ came into this world. And he not only met evil, but more importantly, he defeated, he defeated evil with what? He defeated them, defeated evil with what? Good. Good, goodness and sacrifice. Sacrifice, okay. A third one. I'm looking for a third one. Love. With good, goodness, with love, with sacrifice. I need to add, that's another good word. So I need to say, what three things did he do? But sacrifice is part of it. He sacrificed himself. But he did it out of love. He defeats evil with love and goodness, okay? And so as Christians, true Christians, we need to remember this because to allow yourself to be overcome, controlled by evil, have vengeful thoughts and take actions with vengeance, means that you're doing nothing more than what? To do all to still try and overcome evil with a greater evil means that you we would end up doing what? That you're doing more than keeping evil what? Alive. Alive. Going in this world, okay? But worse than that, not only you keep evil going in this world, you end up giving evil 
Strength and power over who? Yourself. Yourself. You see, we feed evil when we try to repay evil with evil. We fuel the fire. And what we do, we give strength and power to that evil over us. That's why Paul means what it means. In the original Greek text, now y'all might have something very similar, because in this one it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the new revised. But in the Greek it says, be not conquered by the evil. But conquer the evil with the good. Be not conquered by the evil, but conquer the evil with the good. So once again, the only way to overthrow and not be conquered by evil is to do what? Return evil with goodness. Okay? And what actually happens when we do this? You see, you take the negative force or the negative power of evil and you transform it into something like that. Good. Good, Good or positive. positive. You take the negative force, the negative power of evil, you, you, you go against it the way we're called, it becomes you turn into something positive. But most importantly, what happens when we confront evil with good and transform it into goodness? Well, God wins. Goodness wins. And when God wins, who wins? We. We win. See, never forget that. That's one of the things about the book of Revelation. People want to get scared by it. All the time, read the end. God wins. <laughs> we win. Go, go straight to the end. God wins. And when God wins, God's people win. Same thing today, even in our lives right now. When you and I choose to return evil with goodness the way God's word. And once again, you've got to ask yourself, do you truly believe this is God's word? If you do, then you've got, then I've got a long ways to go. <laughs> hey, like I said, I'm out there driving, and I tell you a number of times, I've wanted to just meet some evil driver <laughs> by checking them with my bumper and putting them into the ditch with my evil car. <laughs> You know, i got to work on it too. But I do believe in God's word, so this is something I've got to work on. It's tough. It is tough. It is not an easy thing to do. So we are called to do this, okay? So that's the marks of the Christian, okay? But now, let's go to the next hardest thing. And now this is where, this is, I promise you, this is about to become Mr. Harold's favorite passage found in the letter to the Roman Church. This is going to be his favorite passage of all. So join me now in chapter 13, okay? We're going to look at the first seven verses. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority or government resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to the conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority of the government? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only because of um, subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, busy with with this very thing. Pay to all what is due to them. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Reverence to whom reverence is due. Respect to whom respect is due. Honor to whom honor is due. Well, now, <coughs> you can create an argument. I know, but now, 
But now, first off, we've got to remind ourselves, we're as Christians, we believe this is God's Word. So let's look at it. Uh, All right, let's look at this. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. Look at verse 1, okay? <laughs> now, the truth is this. <laughs> what do we have actually happened in the opening statement of verse 1 of chapter 13? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. What do we have happening at this very moment? We have, we have been given a very one specific command. This is a commandment. This is a specific commandment. Let every person be subject. It doesn't say anywhere if you feel like it or if you want to. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. So what we have, first off, is a very specific commandment. A commandment that contains no what? First off, it can, contains no what? Authority. Well, no, it contains authority. It's about authority. But see, first off, it is a commandment that, claim that has no disclaimers, or exception clauses that allows you a way to get out of it. There's nothing that allows you to not be obedient to. Nothing that stops you to be obedient. This is a commandment. A commandment has no disclaimers, no exemption clause, no way to keep you from having to be obedient to it, okay? While at the same time, secondly... At the same time, it is a specific commandment that's given to who? Everyone. To everyone. Every person has to be subject to the governing authorities, okay? So, first off, we got a commandment. And if you're going to believe God's word, you got to remember this is a book of commandments, not a book of suggestions. So, right off the bat. But now, continue looking at verse 1. Because don't worry, Mr. Harold. <laughs> Paul follows up this commandment by then telling us that we can and should be obedient to this commandment because of what two reasons? What's the very first reason why we can and should be obedient to this commandment? What's the, what's the next thing that it says there? After the commandment, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is what? No authority no. except from God. No authority except from God. The complete Jewish Bible says, for there is no authority that is not from God. The Greek says this, for there is not, for there is no authority except by God. So the first reason why we can and should, you know, we should not fear the power of or authority of the government, government, <laughs> Because of what reason? Because of what? The very first reason we can do this is because what? It comes from because God's God's power and authority is what? Greater. Greater. Remember, who's always on your side? God. God is. So first off, even though it is an authority, God's power and authority is always greater, okay? Greater than the power and the authority of the government, okay? Okay? The government power authority will never be greater than God's power, okay? God is on our, on our side. Secondly, what's the second reason why we can and should? What's the second part of verse 1 in chapter 13? Because why? Because they were instituted from God. Okay, those authorities that exist have been instituted. The Greek says... The existing ones by God have been appointed. I like the, the complete Jewish Bible. It says the existing authorities have been placed where they are by God. And so because God is the one who's instituted, appointed, ordained the concept of government, we are called to uphold and respect our government and our government officials, okay? I, hang on just a hang on just a minute, hang on just a minute. Because then this leads us to asking one major question, okay? Why would God create and ordain the institution of government? 
especially something that is abused and misused constantly to hurt people. And Paul's going to help us to understand that, and we'll pick it back up next week. So we're going to stop here. So hang on to your questions. <laughs> we're going to stop here for us tonight. But Paul's going to, you know, because that's the, that's the first response. Why would God create something that can be used to hurt people? God has a reason why. Okay? But first and foremost, don't ever forget, yes, there's power and authority in government, but we have one on our side whose power and authority is great. Okay? And that means we have to do what? Trust in God. Okay? We still have to be obedient. But we're going to look at this some more, okay? Because it's already after 630. So let's stop here. We'll pick up next week. So come back and and listen to Mr. Harold. <laughs> I know he's got to have a lot of things to share on this one, okay? But come back. We're going to, we're going to figure this out. God's not going to leave us hanging with this word. So come back and join us again next Wednesday. Until then, take care and God bless and goodbye.